episode six of the Natilic podcast, season two. First time coming to you in video form, listener. A little treat for you there. Um, and if you're audio only, then we're going to have a treat for you still, as we're going to be having a brilliant conversation with the excellent Pure Storage around backup and restore. We're going to talk about the modern backup and restore experience and get some advice from our experts on data protection. We're going to get a couple of experiences of uh, recent engagements with some clients and give you some, some real life examples. And we're going to get an update on the state of the storage market from Pure Storage. Uh, so let's introduce our guests. Firstly, going to come to Max Brown, one of the best man cave home working setups in the business. It's a good thing that we're on video so that people can see. How are you doing, Max? Are you good? Yes, I'm good. Thanks. I'm good. Yeah, it is a nice little setup. It's, uh, you know, when they said everyone's got to work from home, I was like, okay. So, uh, you know, plug in the Xbox, play a bit of games, got my vinyl, everything's good here. Uh, usually there's a dog on that sofa, but I've kicked him out because he'd only bark halfway through. Uh, yeah, so my background, I've been at Pure Storage seven and a half years, uh, one of the first people in the UK. So I've seen it kind of grow from very small to extremely large. Um, in terms of what I've done previously, I have worked in storage for the last kind of almost two decades. I um, mean, I've worked for companies such as Equalogic, Dell, HP, uh, Veritas, 3PAR, uh, you know, gone through many acquisitions with a lot of those. But um, yeah, here I am today at Pure talking to you guys. Yeah, good to have you on board. Good to have you on board. And uh, next thing we come to you, Stephen, another pure storage specialist. Um, I know you've got an excellent, very impressive background. So how are you? Good to have you aboard. Yeah, yeah, very good. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, if that was a picture behind Max, I'd be jealous. That's a fantastic place to be. I so, did think yeah. it was fake the first time I saw it. I thought it yeah, was so, like, so know, did I, just but... Googled man cave backgrounds. <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> So, 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 yeah, so Stephen Bailey, I'm uh, now working at Pure Storage. I've been here only a short period of time, three and a half months, but seen some very interesting, uh, some very interesting things that we're doing with customers and had a lot of good conversations. I've uh, been in the, worked as a, working as a data architect in the Flashblade environment, worked in uh, storage and IT for 23 plus years, like uh, Max has. I've uh, seen a lot of changes. It's a very exciting time to be in IT, and I'm sure that um, you know everybody's feeling that that's in this field. So uh, that's me. Yeah, awesome, awesome, awesome. Lots of experience, which makes me feel relatively like a baby. <laughs> which said three decades. We've got two decades, and I'm here with one. Shameful, Nigel. I'm going to hope you're not going to embarrass me even more, but. Um, I'm going to come to you next. If you could introduce yourself, my man, one of the best beards in the business. So again, it's a good thing we've got got that video. Um, how are you doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah, good. Thanks, Rob. Good, good. Yeah, I don't have the man cave at the moment because uh, I've just moved in in the last couple of months. So uh, we're through that whole stage of, nice, of redoing though. the property. So Scandi I just find anywhere that I can uh, I can sit down. So. Uh, yeah, yeah, but it's going to be here. But, but no, I'm going to embarrass you as well. You've got the old guard on today because I've been in the industry myself over 20 years. i um, been playing around in data centers for around about 17 or 18 of those. Um, obviously, as you know, I'm not pure. I, I work in Natilic, solution architect here. But, um, yeah, my good. focus is well, uh, around data center. And the experience is a good thing, right? I mean, that's what our, our listeners are here to, to draw upon. So um, why don't we start off then? by just taking a look at Max, I'm going to come to you just to kick off the discussion. So last podcast we did with Pure Storage, we got a, a bit of a overview of the market. I think you guys had just been confirmed again to be a Gartner Magic Quadrant leader. Um, only good things have continued to go on from there. So would you mind just giving us a quick introduction to Pure and just sort of where we're at and then giving us a, a view of the state of the market from, from where you're standing at the sure, moment? Sure, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you know, things have just been going from strength to strength. Um, you know, literally yesterday or the day before we announced our um, Q2 results. Um, you know, we, we've uh, grown our business 23% year on year. Uh, we've had a 31% growth in our subscriptions, which is quite a key part of the business. We've got roughly 9,000 customers globally, about 500 in the UK. Net promoter score, which is kind of a measure of, of would a customer recommend us to one of their colleagues, is at 83, which, in, you know, which is far in excess of what you're seeing in the IT industry. 
Um, as you said, Gartner Magic Quadrant, top right leader for the last seven years. And then really a lot of this comes down to what we like to call is our modern data experience that we're providing to customers. And in terms of that modern data experience, there's kind of three layers to it. And the first layer would be about modernizing your infrastructure, right? So, you know, we came to market about 10 years ago with almost the industry's first all flash array. So we introduced the flash array into customers where at the time most customers were using technologies built on spinning disk, right, which is 30 year old architecture and it'd be crazy to be kind of using that in production today. So we pioneered the all flash array. So it's about modernizing your infrastructure. And, you know, currently today we've got the flash array X, the flash array C and also flash blade, which will play a large part in our discussions today about backup, restore and kind of ransomware. The next bit was looking at modernizing your operations, right? So how do you manage these things? And we have uh, a tool or kind of a portal called Pure One. This gives customers, you know, the ability to easily manage their fleet and also see what's happening in their environment. You know, see what the storage is doing, how to predict what it might do. You know, this is a key thing. How do you work out when you need to add more capacity, when you need to add more performance? How do you predict what if scenarios? You know, what if my SQL database got three times bigger in the next six months. What impact would that have? It's things like that. We also introduced something many, many years ago, about six or seven years ago, our evergreen approach. And this, as a simple way to describe it, is generally when someone buys a piece of hardware, after three to five years, they're going to buy a new piece of hardware to replace the old piece of hardware. We just said that's wrong. The way we've done it looks in some ways like a mobile phone contract. That's the best analogy I can think of where once you have the pure storage array, you never have to buy a new one to replace the old one because the old one doesn't get new. We refresh the components within that array, certain components to make sure it never gets old. And we do that non-disruptively, which means you never have to buy new technology in the same way with a mobile phone on a contract. You never buy a new phone. It's all just built in. And then pure as a service. So again, a lot of demand we're seeing is less around the capex, I want to buy an array for X thousand dollars. It's more like, actually, I need that array, but I'd rather pay for it on a kind of committed spend basis or pay per capacity, pay per gigabyte or terabyte used. So a real kind of subscription model. And the last piece is kind of modernizing applications, right? Everybody's been doing, you know, the traditional Microsoft VMware type applications for a number of years. But, you know, the big ticket, the big thing that's coming now are things around containers, microservices, Kubernetes, we've got some fantastic solutions such as Portworx and Cloud Blocks that fit into those environments because people are looking at doing something different with their applications. And whether it's on premise, whether it's in the cloud, you know, we've got solutions that span both of those to give you a true hybrid cloud solution. And also, you know, Flashblade does pay a, play a big part in some of these modern applications that people are using when they're using things like Elasticsearch or they're using things like Splunk, you know, very different types of applications. From a market perspective, where we're seeing the biggest demand and the things that are really kind of customers want a lot of conversations around are around doing things as a service, doing things on a subscription basis. You know, I mean, admittedly, yep. you know, a lot of our revenue still does come from a customer who buys an array for X amount of money. And then at the end of three years, that customer may only have used 70 percent of the capacity. So the reality is, have they wasted 30 percent of their money? You kind of you could say potentially, yeah. It would have made more sense if that customer had paid per gigabyte from day one. So at the end of three years, they've paid for what they've used. They haven't overpaid. And, you know, as I said, that subscription revenue is growing 30 percent pretty, pretty much year on year. So there's a huge uptake of that. It's safe to say you guys were one of the first to bring in a model like that and not just kind of followed suit. A lot of a lot of the kind of larger companies have always had some kind of storage on demand where you could have a load of capacity put in your data center and you paid for it as you used it. But the model that we looked at, that we looked at doing, it's a true kind of OPEX model. There's no CAPEX. It is not a lease. That's it's it. not some yeah, kind of finance. It, you know, usually when you say storage as a service, you think of cloud, right? But this is storage as a service with real physical hardware. We can do it in the cloud as well, but generally it's with real physical hardware. But the asset actually remains with Pure. So it's a real subscription model. And then you just kind of literally pay for what you use. You can set reserves. So it's kind of you get a cheaper cost per gigabyte if you commit to a certain amount. Again, I won't go into detail now, but huge amount of demand around that. Also, what we're seeing from an application perspective, and I alluded to this earlier, is in the world of containers and Kubernetes. And depending on the customer you talk to, you know, our large enterprise customer, the Fortune 500s, they're kind of going all in on Kubernetes. 
you know, 95% of all new applications that are being designed today are being designed using containers and microservices. This is a really big play. Now, talking to the, the smaller clients, they kind of see it coming. But I think the validation of this is VMware with their Tanzu. So VMware, you can now run Kubernetes inside VMware. And I think that might bring kind of Kubernetes and containers to, to the common man in the same way they did with virtualization. And then the other big ticket, right, which is why we're all here today and what kind of the main thrust of today is ransomware. You know, a few years ago, ransomware was one of these things that people thought, oh, I've read about that. It will never happen to me. It's a real geeky kind of hacker thing that happens by some weird people in their bedroom somewhere. But suddenly, you know, you can actually get ransomware as a service, allegedly, right, for legal reasons, allegedly, you know, you can go to some Russian companies and actually buy ransomware. And, you know, you paper how many people you're going to infect. And I think with ransomware now, it, I hate to say it, but it is more of a case of when and not if. And it's what can you do to mitigate that? And every kind of backup vendor, every kind of storage vendor has some kind of solution around that. And we'll cover ours today. And I think, you know, on that topic of ransomware, that kind of leads neatly into um, Stephen and Nigel. So I'll, I'll kind of hand it over to those guys to go into a bit more depth. Yeah, exactly. I think you're right, though. I mean, it's not. No, not a week goes by that you don't read about something in the news um, in terms of ransomware, etc. Right? So um, definitely. So yeah, as you said, that does bring us on to our second discussion. I think that's the the, the modern backup and restore experience. So Stephen, we spoke off air about considerations for businesses when looking at their data center or their sort of backup and restore strategy. Um, what, are, what are some of your suggestions or some of the things that you think that our listeners should be thinking about when they come to, to take a look at those kind of things? I think before we, we, we move to that, so that's a very interesting subject in its own right, but just, just to pick up on what Max said about this <clears throat> ransomware as a service, we all like as a service models and ransomware and the criminal elements have branched out to that because it's big business. And the reason they're able to do that, not because, um, you know, it's easy to do. The, f the fact of the matter is they, they don't want to have to go through all those extra hoops of having to infect environments and manage those systems themselves and manage the collection of the, the ransoms themselves. But what they will do is that they will penetrate um, a company's environment. They will be there on average about 200 days and they're there for, for a specific reason. And what that reason is, is that they're looking to see what your backup strategies look like, what your data looks like, what your applications look like, what your backup strategies look like, what the policies are to govern those strategies. Um, and they're trying to invalidate that or they're trying to build a model, a cohesive model on how they attack your environment in a cohesive manner. So what I mean by that is that when they decide to make a change to your environment, when they decide it's, it's, it's the day they're going to attack, they are, are able to affect your policies of your backups, let them time out so the validity of your backups is no longer valid, and therefore your recovery position is no longer valid. They can affect your core systems, so they now understand your applications, your core systems, the way it works. And as, as you quite rightly understand from that, once you understand that knowledge, once you have that capability, then you can do as much critical damage to that organization as possible. And that's important because if you can do the critical damage and you can give them an unrecoverable position, of course, that makes your hand much stronger in order to be able to, to uh, you know, collect on the ransom, which is what you're there for. And the reality is, as I said, they, they have this dark web, which they're using to sell tools and services, but also they sell this on. They sell the details on. They sell the mapping of your environment. And that gives them that sort of capability to be able to come in and, um, and then, you know, offer that as a service, as a payment service to someone who's going to go ahead and do that. A few recent so, examples of people actually paying the ransom as well to try and, like, release data, isn't there, as well, I think? There's plenty of it. And, and that's only the stuff that we know. And, of course, every time you pay the ransom, you're then, uh, you know, you're then, it's, it's a continual cycle of if they've yes. got money they will then use that money to get more and more professional. And, and that's the reason, that's what you've got to realize, that these are professional, intelligent, large companies now or organizations that are, are, are coming together in order to be able to develop their, their product, if you like, in a more strategic way. So they can then monetize that and they can have this circular approach to how they're, how they're going to address it. 
And this is why, you know, we're having a lot of customer, uh, sorry, um, conversations with customers in order to be able to mitigate that. Not just, it's not just about, you know, I can't get up and my services can't get up. It's about, you know, that, uh, that perception I now have in the market, is your data safe with me? Is your services safe? Can I provide you services? Um, we've had, you know, numerous companies, sorry, uh, uh, conversations with a number of customers. And what they have said is that if I'm down an hour, that really is visible to my customer base. If I'm down 10 days or a day or 10 days, I've got no business left at all because my supply lines, my capability, uh, my communication, everything that I'm trying to be able to 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 offer to my customers in the way of services will be null and void. So, uh, you know, that's a that's a big entity. So, so just going back to your question, you know, what what do they need to do in order to be able to to mitigate this? And the reality is is that if you look at you know what our competitors do and what we do in order to be able to help you to mitigate it, it comes into immutability. So everybody says they're immutable, and immutability is is a, a dependent point or it's a it's a point of perception. So from a user, uh, you know, uh, immutability might be a snapshot, but of course, you know, a point in time copy of your data is great if you're an, a standard user. Uh, you can't change that, and therefore you have the capability of being assured that a user cannot affect that. But the admins, of course, do have that capability of affecting that, and therefore you can wind down your policies. So therefore you have, you know, worm type, you know, read once, write many um, compliance policies set up, and therefore you cannot, an admin cannot change that and that meets that requirement but unfortunately it, it impacts the user's access to that so a lot of our competitors have this idea of an air gap system a system which is off the network which has another set of administrators which i copy another copy of my data over to and then that allows me to be in a situation that i can recover um, the only problem is that that's expensive, that's difficult. The recovery element of that is difficult. And that's why we have in Pure this, this idea of a virtual air gap. But virtual air gapping gives you that capability of, of allowing the customers to continue. When I say customers, I'm talking about people who are using the data to continue to use that data yep. uh, while protecting against the administrators or the privileged accounts in accessing that data. So those are the sorts of things that you need to be able to put in place and you need to be able to recover from at a very quick pace. Yeah, oh, nice. Okay. Um, and what about, I think another thing that we were talking about offline, um, Nigel, was the kind of effect on digital transformation, which is, as I think Max, Max and Stephen have touched on a little bit, um, I think companies can't get into the cloud quick enough. Um, you know, there's a a rapid reliance on things like APIs, open standards and stuff like that. I think we were talking about, and this was really interesting, um, the effect that that's having on cybersecurity and sort of the alarm bells that that's ringing with cybersecurity teams. So could you talk about that a little bit? And um, again, the effect that that's having on, on things like backup and, and, and restore. Yeah, sure. I mean, obviously digital transformation is the way that companies are going. They're wanting to deal with their clients and their personnel way, way more digitally, right? You know, everyone has their phone, their, their PC, their iPad or whatever it is. And that's the way that they're accessing, um, you know, the brands that, and the business wants to operate. So when you talk about digital transformation, it's not only that methodology of contacting and interacting with clients, but it's the back end processes as well. So as a result of the change, which obviously be, brings benefits to the business, right? Because they're able then to interact with their clients far more efficiently. They're, they're able to generate more revenue. Their products that they bring to market are a lot more sound because they're able then to, to not only push out uh, an application very quickly and push out their products very quickly, they're able to iterate on those very well. And then there's like the second stage, right, of uh, digital transformation. Once you've actually got your processes that way, where you've got your contacts, when you've got your application, you've got the ability, especially if you've been an organization around for a long time, you've actually at that point got an asset there, which a new startup won't potentially have. You've got all of this data of decades worth of your client interactions that's just sat there and able to be accessed, right? So, 
So you've got this access to your data. So more and more, not only is, um, you know, the fact that you are digitizing, you've got your application there, but the data more and more, it's becoming more and more critical to, to a business, right? And because their processes are then digitized, then their records are digitized. So the compliance and governance wrap around all of this is critical. So what then happens when someone penetrates your organization and they're able to encrypt that data and you cannot access it anymore? It's not only the fact that your reputation is going to get a hit. It's not only the fact that, yes, you could be obviously get a financial hit at that point in time, but but what are the, the longer term of effects on your governance and your compliance if you cannot then prove what you needed to prove over this period of time? So. So although digital transformation is absolutely brilliant for a company and there's many benefits to it, it then becomes more and more paramount that the data that you have is secured and that if you are here and you are breached, that you're able to recover from that incredibly quickly because otherwise, literally, you know, as Stephen pointed out, it doesn't take long before you as a business could actually be you know, going under as a result. And, and so if I could just if I could just add to that, so uh, and it's it's really interesting because certainly these distributed and these agile work methodologies that are now being addressed are, are great, but going back from a security perspective, of course they're not as secure. And what I mean by that is that if you are if you are sharing data, and we all know containerization is about state stateless you know architectures and stateless applications, however data has value and you'll want to retain that, which means that you're going to have to open up to a much broader um, collection of applications or microservices that are going to all access data and share information. And that that doesn't, it, unless you're controlling that, unless you're managing it, that's opening up, you know, an access or an attack vector for, for ransomware um, capabilities. And not only that, if you add on to the fact that more and more people are working from home, again, that opens up the, the gateway for um, for that access point as well. Now, you can secure, you can certainly look at this. Um, and as long as you have developed strategies and you have made sure that you, you that all of those elements are, are as secure as possible and all the interlinks are taken into account. But as you branch out and as you elongate your compute capability, as you take on new workflows, as you run to that digital transformation, there are a lot of bridges you have to cross and a lot of holes you have to plug to make sure that you have security across your, your data space. If that makes sense. Yeah, it does. I mean, that's the whole defense in depth, right? Yeah. You know, and and throughout that depth, right at the deep and the end point, it's when we're then talking about the storage itself. Yeah. And how that and, data and, uh, is stored. Yeah, and then, and then we, we we come to the, you know the real crux of why you would do a backup because of course we know that data is. I mean, I remember when terabytes used to be large. I've been in the field quite a while, as you can see. But you know, when you had ten terabytes, a hundred terabytes, two hundred terabytes, you were thinking, oh, okay, I've got a a fair sizable environment. I've got some big system holding that data. Now now we're talking about petabytes, you know. I mean, I saw uh, a note saying that um, that we'll have 175 zettabytes by, uh, you know, the year 2025 in order to back up. I mean, that's a ridiculous figure. But, of course, you have to be able to back that up and secure it. And, you know, time's not changing. So the windows in which you're needing to back that up are are shrinking and shrinking. Everybody's, you know, 24 by 7, 365. So there isn't this outage windows anymore, services are 24 hours, a lot of them are digitalized or they're going digitalized. So therefore that capability to be able to serve is that much more important. Yeah. But there's the backup window, then there's the value of the data that you may have backed up or you may have online or near line. And then more importantly, there is the restore capability. If I do get infected and I need to be able to restore, if I have to restore just one database, fine. I'm sure I can do that, and maybe even some of my solutions at the moment may be able to handle that. But of course, you could always be faster, and and money's time. 
But if you're having to restore, you know, larger and large elements, you know, VMware is quite rife in the environment now, being able to restore those rapidly, being able to restore databases, having that instant on capability for core systems to be able to pull them back so you can have a continuance of your of your business and your business will be able to survive. That's the important bit. There's no point in having a backup strategy if your restart strategy doesn't hit your SLAs, doesn't hit your requirements um, from what you're trying to achieve from, from, from the solution itself. And that's really what you know what this solution is offering it's offering that that shrinkage of the the backup and also that rapid capability to be able to get your systems your your uh, your business back up and running in a reasonable time frame to make sure that you have a business at the end of it talking about pure pure flash recovery right as well it's probably worth mentioning i'm not sure that we've actually named <laughs> named it named it just yet <laughs> so. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the reason that we have this uh, this flash recover capability, because it, it it's for modern day. Uh, and, and that modern day capability is exactly what I talked about. How do you move? How do you have that parallel system? And what I mean by parallel is, you know, you, you need you need two elements to be able to back up. Um, you need. You obviously need clients, so we won't take into that account. So your applications, um, you know, your client machines, things that are going to generate the data or hold that data that you'll need to back up. But you'll need a layer in order to, you know, collate that data up and move it somewhere. So that'll be your normal backup um, strategies that you have in order to be able to do it. Uh, to do something like that gives you the intelligence, gives you that global visibility of your of your data space. Uh, and then somewhere to put that data and have that disaggregated so you can you can buy the compute element to do that part of the work you need. And you can buy the storage element in order to be able to not only store the data, but be able to service that up in a parallel way. So if I want to restore you know, my primary databases and a thousand VMs at the same time, I'm capable of doing that. I'm not restoring one database and then a few VMs later on because that wouldn't give me the value I have if I'm having to wait. So that is the, you know, the value behind, um, you know, the, the capability that we're offering. And there's a couple of, I think the examples that we gave are um, quite extreme, but obviously very real and, and do occur. But uh, I think as we transition into our third topic of discussion, um, just coming into kind of some examples, we always like to contextualize these things for clients. Um, I'm going to start with you, Nigel, and the uh, recent uh, opportunity that we worked on with a with a client that we we're not going to name, but I think just in terms of the story itself, I think it's another way of looking at it in terms of you know a review of strategy um, and coming at it from that angle and seeing where we can help or where we and Pure Storage can help. So, would you mind just talking us through quickly um, how how that worked out and what the outcomes and um, and benefits were there? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, but we. We had a one of our clients come to us and uh, undergoing a, a data center move. Uh, so that was the initial scope, you know, being able to um, transition to to new data centers. So it was the entire architectures that we were standing up newly in that environment. They're an existing pure company, uh, you know, client, sorry. So that they, they um, have pure flash arrays, uh, which they're very happy with, uh, one for the simplicity. And so they took the opportunity to to look at the entire environment and to uh, look where they could um, make improvements. And, and one of the areas was with their backups. They, they found their existing solution complicated. And they were also aware that if they ever had to then uh, utilize the backups and they were still reliant on tapes that obviously that could be very slow. And I say utilizing only for part of it, you know, the, the tape library. So they didn't know how long it would take them to actually restore. So one was the complexity of the solution. It was aged and uh, and obviously the, the restore time. And this was critical for them in, in their environment, their uh, financial org organization, the trading house. So to be able to, to recover quickly was top of mind for them, absolutely paramount. And that that's where we obviously had the conversation with them around flash recover. One it gave them the simplicity that they want. One of the things that Pure do very well is that, is simplicity. So that they have a solution in Flash Recover, which is easy to deploy and it's easy to manage. And, and it's, it's fronted up by Pure, so you've, you've got their, their brilliant MPS to support it on. 
Um, so the simplicity took the box for them, but it's also that speed of recovery. When they compared it uh, into just a, uh, a regular you know, run-of-the-mill solution that you can get today, I think it ended up being about six times faster, which for them was absolutely critical. They knew then that they could restore and come back from uh, anything that they were hit with in a timely manner so they could be back up and trading in as quick a time as possible. So, uh, so yeah, that, that, that was the one, um, you know, the client that we had recently. Yeah, I mean, I've got, I mean, there's, there's a couple of other kind of anecdotes around some customers that I've kind of um, I'm seen, but, um, you know, the whole flash recover solution, it is about speed of restore because, you know, ha having been at Pure since the early days of all flash arrays, I've seen pretty much most customers go from traditional spinning disk, which is slow, to a very fast all flash array from Pure or any other of our competitors. What I didn't see happen at the same time was their backup infrastructure and restore infrastructure increasing speed at the same pace. So suddenly production got faster and faster and faster. And then when they needed to do a restore, we had customers using what was at the time a very popular appliance for doing backups. And, you know, it was 3% restore after two days and it was just unacceptable. So now, you know, we, with flash recovery, you know, we're looking at a petabyte a day restore speeds, which is insane, but that's what you need. You know, people need to get back. And if you've been hit by ransomware, it's a nightmare. So just to give you an example of one of our uh, Scottish customers, a government agency, they've been a pure customer since 2016. Um, they look after the core flood warning system for the whole of Scotland. And in December 2020, they had a ransomware attack, which not only encrypted their production data, it encrypted all of their backup data as well. So they were really in trouble. And given that this was Christmas 2020 and it was going to be a very wet and uh, snowy January coming up, their core flood warning system literally was down. So anyway, we, uh, we kind of rallied the troops. We got in a brand new array just to help them rebuild their systems. They were recovering whatever they could. Uh, and then, you know, kind of what they ended up with to, to kind of do a belt and braces approach, they ended up with two of our production flash arrays. They used the original flash array, which was infected, but now clean as a replication target. Now, the piece that the technology that we've got in flash array and flash is something called safe mode, which is, as Stephen mentioned, we take immutable point in time snapshots. But the key thing about these immutable ones is that ransomware can't get to them malicious admins or someone who breaks into your system cannot get to them and cannot delete them. So it's almost your your final backstop. And if you can have your your backup data being snapshotted by this or your backup catalogs, then it gives you kind of the ultimate protection. And to be honest, these guys, they wish they had it earlier. It would have protected them a lot. There is also a public case study on our website, uh, purestorage.com for the city of New Orleans. So again, these guys, they spotted the ransomware attack early enough. They saw some strange logins happening. And the minute they thought this was going to be ransomware to minimize the damage and stop the spread, they shut down everything. 470 servers, thousands of PCs, thousands of endpoint devices. They stopped all internal and external um, data communication. They detached everything from the Internet and then they detached the systems from themselves. So nothing talked to anything. And because of this, you know, this affected not only their 4,000 employees, but their 400,000 residents who couldn't pay taxes, which they were happy about, uh, couldn't book court appearance procedures, you know, literally anything a council could do stopped. Prior to this, they were looking at doing a storage refresh, and this kind of accelerated that. So again, the way that Pure work, within a matter of two or three days, we were on site with brand new storage arrays for these guys. And then what they did is they cleansed the data. Once the data was cleansed, we then assisted them to migrate it on to their new uh, platform, which again was pure. And then what they've done again, they've done the full kind of belt and braces approach. That flash array that they've got in production, that now replicates to a second data center. They've got a flash blade as their target, which is where all of their backup goes onto it. And they're using this safe mode immutable snapshots to protect their backup data and protect the backup catalog as well. And then to really go to the nth degree, that flash blade is also replicated to a second flash blade in another data center. So they're really completely covered. And the big thing for these guys is again, yes, it was so simple to set up, so easy to use that they know if this happened again, or if they needed to do a restore, the fact we can do speeds of up to a petabyte a day, a rapid restore, it, you know, it's, it's of no consequence. They know that it's not gonna be the weakest link. And we've got many other customers who, 
you know, you look at sometimes DBAs don't want to use backup tools. They'd rather do uh, an Oracle RMAN dump or a SQL database dump. And they've put in FlashBlade, five times faster restore, five times faster dumps. We've got a very famous global uh, pizza company, which is, again, public case study somewhere, but they were already backing up Microsoft SQL to FlashBlade. They moved their couch base back up to FlashBlade as well. They were doing an NFS backup, which took an hour. Now it takes 18 minutes using S3 object storage on FlashBlade. So again, you know, we've got lots of, um, you know, kind of stories around what customers have done with FlashBlade because it's so fast and it does sometimes feel like an insurance policy. People don't realize how important it is until they actually need it. And if you can't get your business back up and running in a matter of hours or a day at most, then you're going to be in trouble. And I guarantee you the next purchase they make is FlashBlade for that. Yeah. There's got to be no worse feeling, right, when you kind of realize that it's it's happening. And it's, I mean, that, that, that story with the city of New Orleans is probably, well, I suppose, you know, the, the good guys won in the end because they kind of nipped it in the bud and realized early on. But you you shudder to think about what would have happened if not, right? But, um, yeah. yeah, really powerful stories there. So um, so I think we've covered every, everything there. And um, it's been really interesting, gents. So um, not only kind of the strategic um, taking a look at kind of where where we can help or where you guys can help clients, but also kind of giving some examples there and talking about what's happening in the market. So um, just as a call to action, I draw clients to, and I'm going to include a link in the description, uh, we're going to be running uh, data center clinics where we're going to be running through and making recommendations to clients as well. I'm also going to be including some uh, interesting infographics and data sheets based on, on, on pure storage. So talking about um, both flash recover and the, the wider pure storage portfolio as well. And then if you'd like a bit more of a deep dive into pure storage and uh, again, some of the, the things that have been, they, they've been doing over the last 12 months, then I'd point our listeners in the direction of the podcast that I did with the co-TTOs. Um, Otherwise, all it leaves me to do is to say thank you, gents. So, uh, Stephen, Max, Nigel, it's been an absolute pleasure. Hopefully, we'll uh, see you soon on the pod. Thanks. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. Right, take care.